Good evening, everyone. We'll I'll give a little time for people to come in and then we'll be starting. Good, ev good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to, I think, our fourth book talk of the academic year. My name's Hugh Thomas. I'm the director for the center. And uh, before I introduce the introducer, I'm just going to say a few words. First, uh, just a couple of words about the format, although most of you have seen this before. We are in a webinar format. And uh, so if you have any questions at any time during the meeting, uh, you can type those questions into the Q&A feature. Um, at the end of the presentation, we will have time uh, for uh, hopefully a fair number of questions. And uh, so um, you can type them in then, but you can, as I say, type them in earlier. Want to, uh, note a couple of upcoming events or several upcoming events. So we've got a pretty full plate till the end of the semester. Uh, the university and the center are, co uh, are sponsoring two sessions at the Miami Book Fair uh, featuring UM authors uh, from the English department, Kai Miller and uh, Patricia Engel, uh, and uh, other authors will be present in those. And also Chantal Acevedo is going to be giving a presentation. Uh, so keep an eye out for those. Uh, on Tuesday for uh, graduate students, we have a career development workshop. I'm gonna be going through this all pretty quickly, but uh, if you wanna look up any more of this, you can go to our website at humanities.miami.edu. Uh, with the low, we're co-sponsoring a talk um, related to the new Reviewing American Impressionism exhibit uh, that will uh, feature discussion of this from um, a couple of scholars at UCF who have uh, uh, worked on a forthcoming book looking at uh, art in the US uh, from the uh, position of underrepresented, uh, underrepresented groups and artists. Uh, we have yet another book talk this uh, semester with uh, Steve Butterman. And we have the inaugural lecture from our Polish Heritage Lecture Series. So all that's on our website if you're interested in any more. And with that said, I will uh, turn to tonight's talk and I will uh, turn, uh, turn things over to my colleague, uh, Professor John Funchen from the English Department. Thanks, you. Uh, I am delighted and honored to introduce my colleague, Lindsay Thomas, uh, tonight. I do feel I should register the kind of surrealness of uh, introducing a fellow South Dakotan uh, uh, who I only got to know once we were both wound up at the University of Miami. So I don't know if this is history in the making, but such as it is. Um, Lindsay Thomas is assistant professor of English at the University of Miami, uh, who earlier in her career has established herself as a leading scholar in the fields of contemporary literary and cultural studies, as well as in the digital humanities. She has published copious, copiously with essays in or forthcoming from journals such as Daedalus, the Journal of Cultural Analytics, Surveillance and Society, Media Fields Journal, and in American Literature, for which she won the Innovative Research Award for Best Critical Essay in Science Fiction Studies. Additionally, she has book chapters appearing in several edited collections, including the Palgrave Handbook of 20th and 21st Century uh, Literature and Science, The Routledge Companion to Media and Risk, and American Literature in Transition, 2000 to 2010, published by Cambridge University Press. Professor Thomas is also a co-principal investigator on the multi-institutional digital humanities project, What Everyone Says, which collects and analyzes media about the humanities on a large scale. Employing both computational and close reading methods, this project seeks to understand how the humanities gets discussed in public discourse with the aim of better advocating for the value of humanistic inquiry. 
This impressive endeavor won a major multi-year grant from the Mellon Foundation, and her work in What Everyone Says has contributed greatly to the development of digital humanities research at the University of Miami, providing our graduate students with the opportunity to become proficient in this thriving field. As Professor Thomas pursued this ambitious research agenda, agenda and proved herself a dedicated and indispensable teacher and mentor to our graduate students and undergraduate students, she also completed the stunning book that she will be discussing tonight, Training for Catastrophe, Fictions of National Security After 9-11. Lying at the conceptual center of this book is the notion of preparedness as a paradigm for U.S. national security, as a prolific generator of speculative fictions, as a manufacturer of consent for national security policies, and as a rationale for protecting whiteness by training subjects to ignore, deny, or suppress what Prof Professor Thomas describes as the many disasters of white supremacy. With engaging prose, she examines a variety of media, including but far from limited to congressional hearing reports, graphic novels, FEMA disaster scenarios, professional preparedness documents, a former national security official's fiction, a computer game, Audre Lorde's poetry, the NYPD's plotting of Islamic radicalization, and Jordan Peele's Get Out. This book's amazing range is a testament to both Thomas's critical acuity and to the indispensable role fiction plays in national security and disaster preparation discourse. To be prepared means fundamentally to be able to imagine new threats and how to plot and role play responses to them. These speculative fictions recast the value of the imagination as an object of national security knowledge. And for this reason, at a time when hum the humanities continues to be defunded and derided, Professor Thomas repeatedly reminds us in this book that the departments of Homeland Security and Defense unquestionably believe in fiction's value and have become its largest funders and advocates in the United States to envision what might be the next previously unforeseen disaster just around the corner. Training for Catastrophe is a groundbreaking contribution to contemporary literary studies for how it expands that field of study and for how it enlists formal, formal and cultural analysis to critique preparedness discourse. This book is also an occasion for us to reflect upon how, upon how preparedness has shaped and reshaped our world, especially after these 20 or so months framing some events as disasters for which we ought to have been prepared, the pandemic, the state violence that we ought to accept and just ignore, the killing of George Floyd, and the insurrection that preparedness discourse could not imagine because it denies the violence of white supremacy. So for this reason, I uh, highly uh, recommend picking up a copy of her book, and I'm very pleased to now uh, introduce her and turn over the virtual floor uh, to Professor Thomas. Thank you. Okay, there we go. All right, um, let me just share my screen. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks to everyone um, at the center who has made uh, this talk and so many other talks possible. Oni Dunham, Christina Larson, and of course, uh, the director, Hugh Thomas. Thanks also uh, to John for that incredibly generous introduction. Um, and thank you uh, to all of you who are here tonight. Um, it's, it's good to see you, if only in a, in a virtual format. So the starting point for my talk uh, tonight is the idea that the national security state is one, as, as John has said, one of the primary funders of and advocates for fiction in public life today. Um, I claim in my book that if we want to understand how fiction matters, one of the places we should look is the national security state. As we'll see, national security agencies like uh, like those of us who write and teach and think about fiction for a living, believe that fiction is an important way of learning about the world. Indeed, I, I, as I state in the book, this investment in the pedagogical value of fiction is what ties preparedness to the discipline of literary studies. So my talk today has three parts. The first part is an introduction to this idea and to my book overall. The second part of the talk is going to focus on the weird philosophy of fiction that national security agencies employ. And the third and final part is going to discuss how this attitude toward fiction reflects the foundation of racism and xenophobia on which US national security is built and which, as current events continue to make abundantly clear, hobbles thinking about disaster and, and our ability to respond meaningfully to crises. So. First part is an overview. In 2007, the US Department of Homeland Security 
um, invite our DHS, as I'll refer to it throughout this talk, um, invited uh, writers from the science fiction think tank Sigma to the Science and Technology Stakeholders Conference in Washington, DC to discuss possible future threats to national security. There we go. Um, Sigma, which describes itself as a quote, group of science fiction writers who offer futurism consulting to the United States government and appropriate NGOs, was founded in 1992 by science fiction writer and engineer Arlen Andrews, then an American Society of Engineers senior fellow at the White House. The group includes more than 40 science fiction writers who volunteer to consult with government agencies and provide them with, as the Sigma website puts it, quote, the imagination that only speculative writers can provide. Sigma has consulted for the US Department of Energy, the US Army and Air Force, NATO, and a host of non-governmental organizations, but its participation in the 2007 DHS conference and its subsequent participation in the 08 and the 09 meetings garnered national attention. Newspapers, and we can see some of the headlines about this participation here, reported on the seemingly unlikely partnership between the national security community and science fiction writers, highlighting the crazy ideas and wild imaginations of those in Sigma. Um, articles covering these meetings also focused on the gadgets and devices the writers uh, cooked up in conversation with national security officials, like a cell phone that could detect biochemical attacks and a brain scanning device for bomb sniffing dogs. In general, the coverage of Sigma's involvement with DHS emphasized the seeming incongruity between science fictional ideas that the Sigma writers devised and the serious business of national security, treating Sigma's participation as a sort of amusing curiosity. DHS officials, however, and we can see the seal of the department here, took the collaboration more seriously. They hoped the Sigma writers would help them concoct scenarios of future disaster to use in training exercises. The involvement of sci-fi writers, officials anticipated, would help to remedy what the 9-11 Commission convened to investigate the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001, called, quote, a failure of imagination in the national security community. As the DHS, as DHS communications officer at the time, Chris Christopher described the reasons for Sigma's involvement in the conferences, quote, if you think what you've always thought, you'll get what you've always got. Comments like this from national security officials reflect the state's investment in the power of fiction, a power misunderstood by the news outlets covering the conferences. The post 9-11 US national security state takes fiction very seriously and the consequences of this attitude toward fiction are profound. The collaboration between the Sigma writers and DHS signals a desire on the part of the national security community to harness the professional production of fiction to create knowledge about future threats. That the form this fiction takes sometimes is science fictional, that it's about, for instance, bomb sniffing robotic dogs or brain scanning devices, is almost incidental. DHS is not necessarily interested in these gadgets. DHS is interested, however, in creating knowledge about things that haven't happened, about what it terms the future, and what I call in the book, fiction. The best way to create this knowledge, DHS claims, is to enlist the help of people who create futuristic fictions for a living, or science fiction writers. In the book, uh, I focus in on the security, uh, the national security framework known as preparedness. Preparedness, the domestic component of the US war on terror has been at the center of US national security policy since 9-11. Although as I'll discuss later in this talk, its history goes back much further than that. Like the military doctrine of preemption, which emphasizes the need to act on security threats before they fully materialize, preparedness programs train people to imagine and respond to disasters before they happen. While modeled and based in counterterrorism efforts more broadly, preparedness does not restrict itself to counterterrorism alone. Rather, under preparedness, natural disasters, industrial accidents, disease outbreaks, and terrorist attacks altogether, all of them constitute threats to national security and therefore events for which people should be prepared. But because the probability and severity of events like this cannot be calculated, preparedness emphasizes institutional readiness and emergency management rather than prevention. Officials and members of the general public alike undergo training in how to handle a variety of uh, catastrophic threats using the same protocols for response. These protocols include 
Everything from how to prepare individually for a wide variety of events to developing procedures for determining who the first responders on the scene should be, what resources should be sent where, and how best to protect and ensure the continued functioning of vital infrastructure during and after a disaster. In this way, preparedness uses fiction to produce knowledge about how to get ready for real disasters or, or to, to produce knowledge about disasters that may happen. As we can see from the image on the left side of this slide, which has the header join the community emergency response team, preparedness training, uh, which is designed and funded by the federal government doesn't only happen within governmental agencies or institutions. It also occurs in workplaces, schools, state and local governments, neighborhoods, and communities. In fact, about six to 7% of the total enacted budget for the Department of Homeland Security for the past five years is, earmarked, uh, is, is usually earmarked for preparedness uh, training grants for state and local governmental agencies and NGOs. So the potential audience for preparedness training, in other words, extends not just to government officials, but also to many broad segments of the general public in the United States. In fact, many of, of, of us here today have likely participated in such training, which includes everything from developing or practicing hurricane preparedness protocols in Miami in particular, to active shooter, active shooter training, to something as simple as going through the security line at an airport. From this perspective, DHS is not just the largest federal funder of an advocate for the value of fiction in the US today, it is also among the federal agencies with the most reach and potential influence. In my book, I'm primarily interested in the materials that national security organizations and agencies of all kinds create for the purposes of training people in disaster response. These materials, as John indicated, include everything from policy documents and workplace training manuals to training exercises themselves to comics and video games created by the CDC and FEMA. Throughout the book, I'm interested in what we can learn by focusing on the techniques these materials employ to persuade people to respond to disaster in specific ways. This attention to the rhetoric and aesthetics of these works has influenced how I've organized uh, the book. Uh, this slide lists the book's table of contents, and as we can see, each chapter after the first one is organized around a different concept or technique uh, from fiction, realism, genre, character, and plot. And the first chapter details preparedness, uh, preparedness's philosophy of fiction. So in my remaining time today, I'm gonna to pull material from chapters one, two, and four to tell a story about how preparedness uses fiction and what this means. So the second part of my talk is preparedness and its philosophy of fiction. To ask how the national security state understands and values fiction is to ask how national security materials themselves evidence the philosophy of fiction or more informally, something like an attitude toward fiction. This attitude like preparedness has a long history in national security policy. So before I talk about what this attitude is like today, I wanna to back up a little bit and talk about some of its history. Scholars have traced the emergence of what we now call preparedness at least as far back as the early Cold War of the 1950s and early 1960s. During this time, many preparedness efforts revolved around nuclear preparedness. Civil defense, which was developed as the domestic counterpoint to the military strategy of nuclear deterrence, sought to prepare American citizens for the possibility of nuclear war. The forms that this preparation took were many and varied, like they are today. Federal, state, and local governmental agencies, for example, facilitated disaster preparedness courses, carried out emergency drills, built community shelters, and developed evacuation protocols. What all of these forms of preparation had in common was, uh, was a concern with how to manage so-called unthinkable catastrophe, uh, nuclear war. A figure important to this moment in the history of preparedness is Herman Kahn. Okay, so Herman Kahn worked as an analyst at the RAND Corporation, um, which is a scientific and global policy think tank during this time. Um, and as, as I suggest on this slide, he is widely understood to be one of the primary inspirations for the title character of Stanley Kubrick's 1964 film, Dr. Strangelove. While Kahn's early work at RAND was about modeling the behavior of particles in nuclear reactors, during the 1950s, he began to turn his attention to scenarios about nuclear war. These scenarios were situational, so they were about providing details about fictional nuclear attacks, describing where and when these attacks occurred, 
what they destroyed and how many casualties they caused. Planners use such scenarios as they do today to form the narrative backbone of, of nuclear preparedness training exercises. These scenarios set the sort of scene of the disaster and provide information that participants need to take part in the exercise. In creating these scenarios, Khan hoped that officials and planners could use them to develop uh, response protocols. After the publication of On Thermonuclear War in 1960, uh, which contains a number of these nuclear war scenarios and which is still Khan's most popular and most infamous work, Herman Khan became well known both within and outside of the world of strategic analysis. Indeed, Khan is still recognized today among many emergency planners, analysts, and academics alike as a pioneer in scenario development, and his influence has spread far beyond the realm of national security to include areas such as environmental science and business. And here's just a shot of some of his later work um, that moves beyond nuclear, uh, nuclear scenarios about nuclear disaster into other realms. Khan even popularized the use of the term scenario itself to mean an imagined situation used for planning purposes. And he, he stole that term, or he borrowed that term from Hollywood. It's an out, it was an outdated term for a screenplay uh, by the 1950s. There's a lot to say about Khan's importance to the history of preparedness and disaster management more generally, and I go into some detail about this in the book, but I wanna to focus today on his main contribution to the philosophy of preparedness, which has to do with his insistence that officials creating disaster scenarios of any kind should focus not on the events that are most likely to occur, but rather on those that seem improbable or at best or even in some cases, wildly outside the realm of probability. So here are some examples of uh, some sort of schematic figures that give a sense of uh, some of the types of scenarios that Khan was designing. On the left is an escalation ladder, um, which attempts to describe the steps and escalation of crises into various different kinds of war. On the right are six, what he calls six national postures toward thermonuclear war that Khan discusses in detail and on thermonuclear war, and also the predicted correlations between the number of people who die in a nuclear war and how long an economic recovery after such a war might take. This table in particular, the one on the bottom right there, struck many at the time as it might strike us today as both particularly sociopathic and wildly optimistic. So Khan published numerous reports and books on national security and disaster management throughout his career. And he cautions in much of this work against implicitly equating plausibility or what seems likely to happen with probability, what is likely to happen. For example, in his 1962 book, Thinking About the Unthinkable, Khan writes, and this is the quote on the slide, it is important not to limit oneself to the most plausible, conventional, or probable situations and behavior, because to understand the problems of national security and international order, we must be sure to analyze improbable and terrible situations. Khan emphasizes here that the possibilities scenarios envision should not be tethered only to what analysts think most likely to happen. Instead, analysts should focus on worst case scenarios. His reasoning goes like this. Although it is improbable that things will go badly in the first place, it is also impossible to know how exactly things will go badly if they do. So it is therefore important to analyze in specific detail five or 10 of the thousands of equally possible terrible situations to get at least some view, however distorted, of the possibilities. For Khan, what is plausible is not necessarily what is probable and vice versa. In the end, the only thing that establishes a scenario as plausible for Khan is the events, is that the events it describes are possible. So in this way, Khan relates plausibility to possibility, not probability. And in the book, I call this the possibilistic logic of preparedness. Khan received a lot of criticism for this, both within and outside of the national security and civil defense communities at the time. Many claimed that his scenarios of nuclear disaster, especially those included in on thermonuclear war, were essentially fantastic and unrealistic and therefore misleading or dangerous as tools of national security. In response to these critics, Khan writes in one of his manuals on scenario design, quote, the scenario is usually not used as a predictive device. The analyst is often dealing with the unknown and to some degree unknowable future. In many specific cases, it is hard to see how critics can be so certain 
there is a sure divorce from a reality which does not yet exist and may yet surprise them. The scenario's aim for Khan is not to describe what will happen, is what he's saying here. Rather, scenarios are narrative simulations of possibilities, projections of things that might happen, but that are not necessarily likely to happen. Moreover, a scenario for Khan will never coincide with reality, no matter how plausible it may seem. Scenarios will only always be fictional. Khan argues that just as it would be weird to claim that a novel, no matter how re realistic that novel may seem, details events that will happen. He also claims that it's weird to assume that the nuclear disaster scenarios he concocts will happen. Just like the models of gamma ray particles he worked on in his early days at RAND, Khan views scenarios as models in which the distance between what could happen and what will happen always remains unbridgeable. So I wanna fast forward now and talk about Khan's lasting influence on the post 9-11 national security era in the United States. There's a lot that happens between the early Cold War period and the post 9-11 period in US national security, but to sum it up quite generally, one important thing that happens is um, that the idea that you can prepare for natural disasters in much the same way that you can prepare for nuclear disaster or terrorist uh, attacks begins to take hold. This is to say that the realms uh, during this time, the realms of emergency management and military preparedness began to merge. This merging accelerates with the end of the Cold War, such that by the time the attacks of September 11th occur, it doesn't take much, and indeed it seems quite natural to install preparedness at the center of national security policy with the creation of the Department of Homeland Security in 2002, um, which we see on this slide. So how does Khan's possibilistic logic work after 9-11? How and where does it show up in preparedness materials from this time? To answer this question, I wanna look at a specific well-known training exercise, the Hurricane Cam exercise. In July, 2004, in Southeast Louisiana, one year before Hurricane Katrina would hit, FEMA sponsored a large hurricane preparedness training exercise that brought together more than 300 local, state, and federal emergency response officials. The fictional hurricane created for the exercise, Hurricane Pam, was designed as a category three hurricane that in the information given to participants, which you see on the slide, um, caused 10 to 12 feet of flooding throughout most of New Orleans, and uh, affected more than 3 million people, resulting in 175,000 injuries and more than 60,000 deaths. Again, these were the scenario parameters. The point of the exercise of Hurricane Pam exercise was for participants to use this fictional information about a fictional hurricane to develop comprehensive plans at the state and local levels for responding to actual hurricanes. One year later, of course, Katrina made landfall just outside of New Orleans. After FEMA's disastrous failures on almost every level in the aftermath of that storm, the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs, headed here by Susan Collins and Joe Lieberman, um, held a hearing about the Hurricane Pam exercise as part of its efforts to determine the reasons behind FEMA's failure. During this hearing, exercise participants, emergency managers, and senators alike defended the Hurricane Pam exercise by positioning it as equivalent to the actual Hurricane Katrina that happened. The hearing transcripts appendix, for example, includes a table that compares the quote, projected consequences for Hurricane Pam and the actual results produced by Katrina. This table, which refers to these projected consequences as data, is meant to provide evidence of Hurricane Pam's effectiveness because of how it, quote, actually and eerily predicted the effects of Katrina. And here I'm quoting from the hearing report. Participants in the hearing repeatedly say things like, Katrina was a replication of Pam. Pam became Katrina. Pam was a dry run for the real thing. And the simulation became reality. As Joe Lieberman put it during the hearing, if Katrina had made a direct hit on New Orleans, instead of landing about 15 miles to the east of the city, quote, 67,000 deaths would have resulted because that is what the PAM exercise projected. Something more than analogy is happening here, I argue in the book. By this logic, Hurricane PAM was not merely like Hurricane Katrina. Rather, the statements hearing participants made emphasize both that there actually is no difference between a fictional hurricane and an actual, hur and an actual hurricane. So on the one hand, the fictional 
Hurricane Pam predicted the effects of actual Hurricane Katrina. So the simulation became the reality. At the same time, um, these statements suggest that Hurricane Pam is of course fundamentally different from Hurricane Katrina. So on the other hand, Katrina wasn't an exact replica of Pam, obviously, and we are lucky that it wasn't because 67,000 people would have died. Hurricane Pam, a made up hurricane created for the purposes of a training exercise, is therefore evidence both of what would happen in the future and of what could or might happen in the future. This is the possibilistic logic of preparedness in action. We can see it even more clearly if we look at a contemporary disaster scenario that's a bit more outlandish. I look at a few in the book, but the one I wanna focus on today is called Con Plan 8888 which is a counter zombie dominance scenario created by junior military officers attending an emergency planning institute at the Joint and Combined War Fighting School in 2009. It describes a variety of military tactics that could be undertaken, quote, to preserve non-zombie humans from the threats posed by a zombie horde, end quote, and it includes detailed descriptions of the different kinds of zombies that might exist, the supplies needed to survive the onslaught, and the challenges the military would face in performing anti-zombie operations. All in all, Comm Plan 8888 assembles a comprehensive inventory of information, strategies, and materials for a military response to a zombie plague. Of course, as you can probably tell, Comm Plan 8888 is not a real training scenario. It's a pedagogical tool. It was created to teach trainees in military emergency management and planning how to create disaster training scenarios. Yet despite the obviously science fictional nature of this document, Con Plan 8888 begins with a disclaimer that it was, quote, not actually designed as a joke. On the contrary, the planners discovered, quote, that the hyperbole involved in writing a zombie survival plan actually provided a very useful and effective training tool precisely because such a plan was so ridiculous and completely impossible. Furthermore, the scenario refers to its own impossibility throughout by using fictional sources as evidence for the claims that it makes about zombies, citing information about the dispositions and behavioral patterns of different kinds of zombies drawn from the game Plants vs. Zombies, the film Signs, and the books World War Z, the Zombie Survival Guide, Zombies vs. Unicorns, and the Zombie Combat Manual. The scenario designers also comment on this use of evidence, stating that, quote, while unfortunately, science provides almost no useful data about zombies, science fiction does. As they write, quote, the more robust a science fiction scenario is, the more useful it is for planning purposes, regardless of how outlandish it might be. I think we should pay attention here to the distinction between robustness and outlandishness. As with con scenarios, the robustness of these plans does not actually depend on their plausibility. It doesn't matter how outlandish a training scenario is, it is considered robust as long as it provides facts that help planners create scenarios in which participants can immerse themselves and so challenge their assumptions. In fact, by moving the scenario out of the realm of possibility entirely, the designers of Con Plan 8888 claimed that trainees were better able to learn and practice the intricacies of scenario development because they were not concerned with so-called real world implications. They were freer to explore the, ba the basics of scenario development by, as the scenario designers put it, quote, suspending reality for a few moments. I, I just wanna emphasize how strange this idea actually is. The suspension of reality runs counter to what we might think of as a basic principle of exercise and scenario design, which is that training exercises should be realistic. And indeed, generally speaking, preparedness materials also emphasize again and again that the more real a scenario is, the better it is. For example, a handbook by FEMA on exercise design states that the atmosphere during a training um, exercise should mimic, quote, the environment of the emergency, meaning it should be stressful and tense due to real-time action and the realism of the problems. Likewise, emergency planners argue that scenarios are valuable training tools precisely because, quote, the realism that is brought to the table during these events really makes the planning feel more urgent. So according to this logic and counter to Comm Plan 8888, the realism of training exercises is central to their function as training tools because they seem real, 
participants learn to respond to emergencies under these so-called real world conditions, and then they're better prepared to handle actual disasters when they occur. So while driven by the need to suspend reality in order to focus on fictional disasters, training exercises are also at the same time supposed to be realistic, both so that participants buy into them and so that participants are better trained after they complete them. This is a fundamental contradiction at the heart of preparedness's philosophy of fiction. How can a completely impossible scenario also be realistic? So in the book, I spend a lot of time trying to answer this question by examining how training exercises claim to be realistic and what they actually mean when they use this word. But for the rest of my time today, I wanna to stay with the zombies. So I'm gonna step back from the question of what it means for a training exercise, an obviously made up thing to be treated as if it's real and turn instead to a consideration of some of the consequences of this paradoxical attitude toward fiction as both a real and a made up thing. So the third part of my talk, what does it mean to be trained for catastrophe? Throughout my book, I argue that by employing this philosophy of fiction, this paradoxical philosophy, preparedness materials train people to think about disaster in particular ways. These materials train people to recognize some specific kinds of events as disasters, hurricanes, pandemics, terrorist attacks, but they also train people to ignore other kinds of disasters. Specifically, they train them to ignore long running systemic disasters that are sometimes hard to see for some people, but that are actually at the root of many of the more visibly spectacular events preparedness materials emphasize. So take us through this idea. I'm gonna focus on the CDC's popular 2011 zombie pandemic preparedness public awareness campaign. The zombie themed campaign is the CDC's most popular to date. The initial blog post that kicked off the campaign in 2011 attracted 3.6 billion impressions in less than a year. And within three days of its posting, the CDC's zombie preparedness page was experiencing more than 60,000 page views per hour. So it went viral. Uh, the CDC produced many different kinds of materials for this campaign. I'm gonna focus my remarks on a comic they created titled Preparedness 101 Zombie Pandemic. We can see the cover of that comic on the right side of the screen here. Preparedness 101 tells the story of Todd, the male protagonist, his female partner, Julie, and their dog, Max, who late one night, hear reports of a strange virus on the nightly news. The narrative includes all of the most recognizable conventions of the zombie disaster genre. Um, conventions that might be familiar to you if you've seen any zombie film from the past 50 years or so, and which you can see rep represented on this slide. So shortly after hearing the reports, a once familiar friend turns into a zombie and tries to attack the protagonists. The protagonists then gather their emergency supplies and hole up in their basement for several days until they are forced out. They flee to a government run emergency shelter, barely making it through a gauntlet of the undead on their way. Meanwhile, scientists scramble to create a vaccine while the military guards the perimeter of the shelter. And then at the end, even though the scientists succeed in making a vaccine, the zombies defeat the military and overrun the shelter anyway. And we'll talk a lot more about this panel in a minute. But then the narrative takes a sharp turn away from the familiar contours of the zombie disaster genre. With the zombies closing in on Todd, which you can see on the bottom, of this page. The next frame jumps to an image of Todd waking up alone on his floor with Max. Readers learn along with Todd, as we can see in this bottom left panel, that it was all just a dream. There had been no zombies after all, not really. Instead, Tom, Todd learns that a severe thunderstorm is on the way and he goes down to his basement to look for a radio to use during the storm. After looking around, he realizes he should have all of his emergency supplies gathered in one place just in case something happens. Todd's dream therefore inspires him to create an emergency preparedness kit. The inside back cover of the comic itself also lists items the reader can include in their own all hazards emergency kit. And then the back cover itself includes a statement from the CDC reminding the reader that the story they have just read is fictional and enjoining the reader to make their own kit. As we can see in, in, the, in the right of the slide here, the CDC writes, now that you've seen the importance of being prepared, take the time to put 
together an emergency kit with the items included in the checklist on the inside back cover. So many people have talked about this campaign as a successful example of crisis communication because it takes something popular, zombies, and uses this popular thing to talk about emergency preparedness, a topic which is sort of boring and uninteresting. In this light, the Preparedness 101 comic is understood by many to be like this statement on the back cover says, quote, both educational and entertaining. But in my book, I'm interested in what we miss if we insist that this is just a straightforward, fun example of successful crisis communication. Specifically, I'm interested in the characters in this comic and in how these characters are used to exemplify and promote a, a sort of important value that all citizens of the homeland are supposed to possess, which is the quality of resilience. Now, I talk a lot about resilience in chapter four of the book and uh, two weeks ago, Alison Shafani in her book talk also talked about uh, resilience. And here on the slide, we can see a sort of graphic about resiliency efforts in Miami-Dade County. Um, I also talk a lot in chapter four about what a character in a fictional work is and about how that relates to the history of the concept of resilience in national security contexts. But it's enough for now to just say that in the context of national security, resilience refers to the ability to adapt to and recover from disaster. This is the self-avowed ultimate goal of preparedness training to make our buildings, our infrastructure, our communities, even the nation as a whole resilient. Preparedness training also seeks to make individual people resilient. As you can see, just from what we've discussed tonight, one goal of this training is to teach people what to do in response to a disaster so that they can bounce back from this disaster more quickly. Many scholars in many different fields have argued that this places the burden of preparedness and ultimately of survival on individuals without the resources or the obligations to assume this duty. Okay, back to zombies in closing. What's weird to me about the CDC pandemic preparedness comic is that the zombies are actually the most resilient characters in this story. This is ostensibly a story about how Todd learns to make himself more resilient by preparing an emergency kit. But Todd is not a survivor in this story. He's not resilient. In the zombie plot line, which readers believe is the plot of the comic until the twist ending, Todd dies. He fails to survive. Even though he and Julie and Max do everything right, they gather their supplies, they hole up in their house, they make it to a shelter, they still fail to survive the zombie disaster. That's because in this comic, it's the disaster itself, the zombies, the putative enemies of the main characters and of the state that have the force of resilience. After all, what is more resilient than a zombie? As we know from the many zombie movies and TV shows and video games and novels produced over the past 50 plus years of the era of the modern pop culture zombie, zombies just keep on coming. They can bounce back from almost anything. They are the ultimate survivors, some of the most resilient characters, preparedness materials could imagine. So the choice to make the ostensible enemies of the comic the most resilient characters is strange, but it's also revealing. I argue in the book that this choice reveals the racial dynamics that are fundamental to US national security, both in its domestic form, preparedness, and its form abroad, the war on terror. Although the zombies in this particular comic aren't explicitly racialized, many scholars have argued that no matter the particular context, the figure of the zombie functions as a stand-in for white fears about black people, as a, or as a figure of anti-black racism, white guilt, and the legacies of colonialism and slavery. Kai McGlover, a scholar of Caribbean and Africana studies, argues that the zombie is inextricably linked to the history of transatlantic enslavement and, quote, to Haiti as a stand-in for the wider, browner, poorer third world. This association has a long history, and time and time again, zombies operate in works of fiction as thinly disguised allegories of our, aka white people in America's, fears of what the so-called third world wants. The zombie, although it's, uh, or the zombie through its inextricable attachment to the history of slavery and to black revolutionaries from Haiti stands in, stands in in Preparedness 101 for the national security state's imagination of disaster in general. Disaster is something that always comes from without, from outside to destroy us. It's something for which good citizens of the homeland must prepare. And it's something that is fundamentally not of our doing even when it is. We can see the, racial, the racialization of the zombie at work visually in the comic itself. So despite the graphic narrative, so you can see sort of overall gloomy look, the living are drawn throughout with light, bright skin, while the dead are dark and shadowy. 
this is a very common trope in, uh, of zombie visual aesthetics. Zombies, even though they are some, supposed to be dead and therefore pale, appear as darker than living people because of their rotting flesh. We can see this contrast most clearly in this image on the slide, um, the image of when the zombie hordes break into the emergency shelter. So in the bottom row of the panels, we can, we can see that the bright faces of the living are easily distinguishable from the gray flesh of the undead. But in the top panel of this page, which I've zoomed in on here, um, the top panel also suggests the supposedly horrifying intermixing of light and dark skin as the dead overrun the living. So towards the bottom and middle part of that panel, we can see this like one man's hand becoming zombified. It's looking like a claw, it's grayish in color. Um, we can see sort of skull-like faces impossible to distinguish as either living or undead arising from the middle of this horde. We can see the face of the woman in the lower right, which is seeming to sort of take on the grayish hue of the zombie that's taking her down. So this panel, in other words, depicts okay. the moment the living become undead, a sort of literal darkening of light skin. The implicit message is if you don't prepare, you'll become one of them. So in conclusion, in the book, this is part of the larger argument I make about in how in training people to respond to specific kinds of disasters, disasters that are more spectacular, disasters that are conceived of as singular events. Preparedness materials also train some people implicitly to ignore other kinds of disasters, disasters that are more slow moving, long running, attritional and systemic. The silly example of the zombies shows us how preparedness as one scholar of national security has put it, quote, works to leave unaddressed the increasing vulnerability and insecurity of everyday American life. Preparedness training teaches some people not just that it is their individual responsibility to prepare for coming catastrophe, but also that such preparation and response are the only ways to deal with disaster. Your town was torn apart by a hurricane, your power is out for months, preparedness training tells you to make sure that next time you have enough water and food to last two weeks. There was another active shooter event at a school, preparedness training materials tell you to teach students to hide in a closet. Preparedness training does not address the systemic nature of these disasters. Instead, it is designed to make such problems seem beyond the realm of intervention altogether and to make some people feel fine about that. After all, the CDC wants us to ask, what do zombies have to do with anything? They're just fun. All right, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Didn't man quite manage to unmute myself right away. Um, so thanks, Lindsay. Um, and I'll remind people that uh, if you have questions, you can throw them into the Q&A. Uh, and uh, we already have one from Allison, uh, who says, wonderful talk, Lindsay, and an exceptional book. Can you talk a bit more about why literary studies and its vocabulary of uh, genre, trope, et cetera, are useful in your readings of preparedness ma uh, materials? Yeah, sure, um, thanks. Uh, there, it's, it's useful in a lot of ways, but I think one of my sort of main uh, methodological moves in this book is to basically like, it's not complicated, do close readings of government documents and, to pay, and specifically to pay attention to them as aesthetic objects. Um, I think normally people don't, always think of things like a training exercise or a document about preparedness plan as an aesthetic object or as something that has an aesthetic so that we or something that, from which we can learn anything about its aesthetics. But um, in, in paying attention to the aesthetics of these objects to things like their genre or the different genre conventions that they draw on to things like how they talk about realism, how they present themselves as real to things like how they depict characters to how they, um, think about plot as a concept and plot themselves narratively. Um, I think in, in paying attention to these more aesthetic and rhetorical and aesthetic things about these documents, and we can actually learn a lot about how preparedness is functioning and, and or moreover how it's meant to be functioning um, on and for certain people. And so I think the sort of um, methods that we you know, normally employ in literary studies of, of close reading and cultural analysis help me to um, understand these materials on a level that sort of goes beyond just what they think they're saying to us. Thanks. Uh, and next question is from Yolanda Martinez-San Miguel. 
says, thanks, Allison, for a brilliant presentation and congratulations on the publication of the book. I'm curious if in your critical review of resilience, you engage theorizations of the anthrop Anthropocene to reframe disaster as human uh, led by first world centric and white supremacist modes of living and thinking. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great uh, question, Yolanda, thanks. So that sort of strain of um, thinking about resilience is certainly present in a lot of the security studies scholarship um, that I was reading in writing this book and that I, that I reference in the book. Um, and it's, it's certainly sort of present in the critiques of resilience that security studies scholars, scholars who focus you know, really on national security and governance and policy, et cetera, um, their critiques that they're making of preparedness and of the ideology of resilience. Um, for, for me, it was sort of um, interesting, important because I'm, I'm approaching this from a literary studies angle to think about um, how the concept of resilience is related to character. And so there I talk about, um, there's a sort of synecdoche, synecdotal relationship in resilience where people stand in for nations and nations are also people, it sort of goes back and forth. And that's a very similar logic as to what a character is. A character is both an individual person and something or someone that stands in for a type of person, a hero, a villain, et cetera. And so I sort of take a literary studies slant on it, but there's a lot of stuff in security studies specifically about what you're talking about. And security studies scholars often imagine a, a, a person that, that they often refer to as the resilient subject. And then they talk about the problems associated with the national security state's imagining of the resilient subject. And what I do is I kind of say, well, okay, they talk about the resilient subject. What if we looked at resilient characters instead? How are these materials presenting these characters to us? And when we do that, they, we discover that they, they think that, that these materials think and feel all kinds of ways that are contradictory about these characters. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. And uh, Meg Hummer says, thank you for a great talk, Lindsay. Uh, if we are less likely to see systemic, more deeply ingrained issues as disasters because they don't fit our traditional understanding of a disaster as a contained, shorter lived, discrete event, are there lessons from the study of fiction to help us broaden our definition <laughs> of disasters? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely want to say that there that there are. Um, I think I spend a lot of time in the book, actually. I mean, this question brings up for me a sort of discomfort that I often felt um, when writing the book about the closeness of my own thinking or uh, feeling about fiction, at least in how I present it to students and that of the national security state, right? I mean, I don't, you know, I, I, I critique the national security state heavily. But there is a deep connection there in that national security agencies really believe in the power of fiction and in the knowledge that fiction can help us gain about the world. And that is like our bread and butter in literary. So, you know, we're constantly telling students that reading fiction, you know, not only makes you smarter, you know, and, and it gives you more knowledge about history and culture, um, it, you know, all kinds of things, right? And so we're constantly as a field, literary studies, searching for justifications for our own existence. And one of them that we all tend to light upon is that fiction is a way of learning about the world, which it is. But this sort of similarity between the project of literary studies as a field and the project of, and how preparedness, national security agencies think about fiction constantly made me uncomfortable in the book. And I, I, could, I, I couldn't do more than just be like, ah, this makes me un, un, uncomfortable. There's like a really close tie between the field of literary studies in, in some ways and preparedness in, in a very strange and unexpected way. And so this question about other lessons from the study of fiction and help us broaden our definition of disasters, yes. I mean, reading fiction can help you learn about systemic racism. Reading fiction can help you learn about, you know, homophobia, reading fiction can help you become a better and more critical observer of the world. But I, I you know, that's as far as I maybe want to go down that road <laughs> right now. <laughs> so uh, as director of the center, I spend lots of time on, you know, uh, how humanities can prepare you for careers and was just at a talk, <laughs> a Zoom talk the other day. So one could envision a talk of humanities to prepare you for disaster preparedness, but I think you're suggesting I shouldn't go there. <laughs> anyway. I mean, I, 
<laughs> I mean, it's right there for us. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Tassie Gulliam, and, uh, sorry, Tassie Gulliam says, thanks, Lindsay, a wonderful book. Can you address the element of kitsch or hokiness in these preparedness narratives? Yeah, yeah, the kitsch or hokiness is, um, it's fun, right? But also I think like for in the zombie example, right, uh, in particular, and with the comm plan 8888, right? These materials get away with a lot by just saying, oh, we're just being silly, right? This is just dumb, like, this is just for fun, right? Like this is just a, a kitschy thing that we're doing to like make it popular and get you to talk about it, right? Um, and so I think that uh, that sort of kitsch factor allows these uh, materials to get away with a lot, um, like, and, and also to, again, sort of be dismissed by a lot of people as either uninteresting or, or not serious, right? And so I think it sort of allows them to fly under the radar a little bit. And they're, I mean, obviously there's a huge kitsch factor, but I think they, they marshal that to their advantage um, if, uh, politically, I would say. Um, and so I think it's, um, you know, th that's what I tried to think a little bit more about in the book is what is that ironic distance that these materials sometimes want us to approach them uh, with what is that doing for them and what can we do to sort of not to to erase that distance thanks uh pat saunders uh, says the curious problematic of resilience is that it encouraged victims to see themselves as fortunate because they have survived things experiences that they should not expect to be exposed to active shooters environmental disasters etc how are we to prepare victims for the aftermath of these horrors is there a space in the discourses of preparedness for the for these realities? Really important question. In answer to your last question, Pat, no, right? The discourse of preparedness is all about what are you going to do to get things functioning again tomorrow, right? What are you going to do to get you know businesses back online? You know, what are you going to do to get people back in the stores as soon as possible to get the economy up and going? And we sort of we're very familiar with this, I think, from the events of the past almost two years now. <laughs> um, I think um, the other sort of question that you have, Pat, about how can we prepare victims for the aftermath of these horrors, that is not something that we can look to preparedness, at least in its current formation, for answers to that, right? And that's also why in the book, I, I, I look outside of preparedness materials a little bit by reading like the poetry of Audre Lorde, for example, has a has a poem um, called Litany for Survival that I that I think about in relation to the zombie stuff in particular. I mean, and I try to think about what is Audre Lorde saying here about survival? Who are the people that she's talking to and talking about? Who are the survivors? What is their affective? What is the affective experience of survival that she's describing for us in this poem? And so I that to me is like something that we in preparedness in its current formation is just not equipped to answer those types of questions. Thanks. Um, Hal Grieb uh, says, most scenarios are created as the last component of exercise design to help exercise designers focus on the evaluation of specific plans more than the scenario itself. Did any difference in scenario design come through in your research to show one held up better light to plan evaluation? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure if I can think of particularly, sick, maybe this is just because I'm very jaded at this point by thinking about exercise scenarios, but it's particularly successful scenarios, but it's interesting that you bring up the issue of evaluation. One of the things that I argue in the book that I didn't talk about today is that um, DHS imagines uh, preparedness as a cycle, right? So as you indicate, uh, creating a training exercise and then you know, doing that training exercise leads to evaluation of that training exercise, which then leads into creating a better training exercise, which then you do that, then you evaluate it, then you create a better one. On and on and on is their sort of imagine is the agency's imagination of preparedness. And so one of the points I try to make in the book is that if we're going to critique preparedness for being unrealistic or not effective, which it is, and it is, and there are studies that show that it's that it's just not a, that most preparedness efforts are not really effective. Um, but if we're going to if we're gonna critique preparedness for that, we're sort of missing the point because we're critiquing a system that sees critique as part of its own system, right? And so we can't <laughs> critique preparedness on its own terms in, in that way per se, yeah. 
So um, we're coming up to nine, but we still have several uh, more questions and I'd like to go through at least the ones that have been asked so far. So if anybody has to leave at nine, just uh, you know, feel free to do so. It's one advantage of Zoom, um, but we will go a little bit past nine. Uh, so David Abraham says, when Donald Rumsfeld uh, talked about preparing for unknown unknowns, he was relying on a long tradition of hordes, not unlike the zombies, the red hordes, uh, uh, with the merging with the Bolshevik Revolution, the Cold War, the yellow hordes of the uh, Korean War, mm -hmm. the Islamist hordes, uh, all this works uh, with out the contemporary black white focus. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, uh, that's more of a comment than a question, but I don't know if you want to comment on the comment. Yeah, sure. I mean, Donna Rumsfeld, someone who I talk a little bit about in the introduction. And I think, you know, you're right that uh, these equations of inside and outside, invader and uh, defender, um, enemy and friend, um, or enemy and citizen um, are integral to uh, US national security discourse as a whole. One of the things that I argue in the book, and it's not just a contemporary intervention, um, is that actually this vocabulary is masking or sometimes just outright denying the sort of racial dynamics that are actually at that foundation and that are really important for US national security. I mean, US national security is about ethno-nationalism. And sometimes that comes out more forcefully in certain historical eras. And sometimes it's, it's less forceful in certain historical eras, but we can't, and I think we sort of run a risk if we deny that um, this that these national security paradigms are not about race because they very much are and there and these preparedness materials I address uh, or I talk about throughout the book are constantly addressing themselves to white people that is their implied audience preparedness is for us white folks basically yeah. thanks uh, Simon Odenine uh, says you said something like uh, what the DHS calls the future and I call fiction can you say more about that equation? <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's fairly simple. It's a little like pithy thing that I'm proud of myself for having written. But yeah, it's basically just like um, the DHS is constantly saying, you know, producing scenarios or training exercises about a hurricane, right? And like with the Hurricane Pam exercise, right? That is a made up thing that they concocted, right? And um, but the sort of rhetoric and force behind these training exercises is that this is a hurricane or this is a disaster that, you know, it may happen in the future, right? This might become real, right? This might like be something that actually happens. In the case of Hurricane Pam, like it was close, right? Katrina was similar in some ways to the Pam hurricane that they envisioned, right? But by saying that these made up things um, are things that could happen in the future, these training scenarios are positing a sort of direct relationship between the things they make up and things that will happen in the future. When really what they're doing is they're just making things up, right? And so as I say, just as it would be weird to say that a realist novel, no matter how realistic it seems, details events that will happen, it's also weird for us to think about these training scenarios as detailing events that will happen. I mean, that's bizarre, but that's the rhetoric that they use. <laughs> Uh, Tom Goodman asks, what relations might you see between blankets of surveillance and a culture of permanent preparedness? Yeah, um, I think they're very much related. I don't talk a lot about surveillance in the book. The last chapter is about if you see something, say something in sort of casual forms of surveillance and teaching people how to you know, detect suspicious activities and people and so forth. Um, and so I think they're, they're very deeply, uh, very much related. There's a, you know, a whole other book that could be written about sort of digital forms of surveillance like the PRISM program. And that's a, sort of the dissertation that I tried to write but then the book didn't turn out that way um, th that are uh, about sort of digital surveillance and how that relates to cultures of preparedness and thinking about national uh, disaster. But in, in this book, I focus sort of on what's often called in security studies, peer-to-peer -peer surveillance or people looking at other people. Um, and how the national security state trains people to look at other people in particular ways and what that means. So I think I'll go with one more question and one more comment. Uh, Bernard Monroe asks, can you say more about how these sorts of experiments in fiction in the real world, uh, in the context too of uh, misinformation and fake news, 
might be shaping what realism means in literature or in how people make sense of texts of all kinds? Yeah, this is a really good question. Thank you. Um, in the book, I talk about sort of what, and this is where I sort of left off in the talk tonight, is I sort of make the argument that what these preparedness materials mean by realism is not actually something like verisimilitude, and it's not, it's certainly not like what what could happen or what has happened or any kind of documentarian understanding of realism or report or an understanding of realism that is like based in reporting or objectivity or fact. It's not any of those things. Um, really what they mean by realism is a sort of feeling of reality that one gets when one immerses themselves in a world which is not their own. This is the same type of feeling that science fictional universes strive to create and fantasy universes strive to create, which is more about not a realism again of verisimilitude, but more of like a feeling that these things are real and I'm feeling really engaged and excited. It's what I call um, a, a more rhetorical understanding of realism in the book. And I argue that this is what these training scenarios actually mean when they talk about um, realism, when I talk about these are, we need to treat things as if they're real, right? And so that as if is doing a lot of work in those uh, formulations. Um, and so I, I think a lot in, in chapter two of the book about, you know, aesthetically how these exercises accomplish this, if they're not interested in verisimilitude, how are they creating in people, how are they designed to create in people certain feelings of realness? Um, or certain feelings of reality. And I think that is a, a similar, a, that's sort of analogous to what fake news does and in, in how it's designed to circulate online. And so it's sort of designed to create a world in which um, it, it's hard to see outside of that world if you're in it, right? And the question is not like, is this probable? Is this likely? Is this actual? But more like this feels real to me. And I think that's pretty similar, yeah. So then we'll end with a, a two-part comment. Uh, Pat uh, Saunders, going back to her, says, thanks so much, Lindsay, really enriching scholarship, thought-provoking. And I'll preface the second part of the comment by saying, how did I not know about zombies versus unicorns? I'm feeling very <laughs> culturally incompetent at the moment. Uh, this fits in. Um, Pat says, by the way, my daughter, who is eight, thinks it's cool that you are talking about zombies versus unicorns. She says, unicorns would win. Um, <laughs> So I think that's a great note on which to end uh, the evening, uh, except for saying thank you to, to the audience for coming on a Wednesday night, but thank you so much, Lindsay, for this great, really interesting talk. Um, and uh, I will applaud wildly for everybody else and uh, uh, people may wanna send emails or, or whatever. Uh, it was a really wonderful talk. And uh, thank you everyone. Hope you come for our future talks, including our next book talk. And uh, uh, have a good rest of the evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye.